I appreciate the opportunity to talk about a topic that I think is very important and is the racial desegregation of public schools. Uh, Dayton, when it desegregated, which was in 1976, it was said, at least by, on the New York Times and by the U.S. Uh, uh, Civil Rights Commission, to be one of the most successful programs in the United States. And it is amazing that by the time the program ended, which was 2002, People were saying it was a failure, that times had changed, and we didn't need racial desegregation. And it's fascinating to me how these opinions had changed so quickly. Uh, one of the reasons why the plan was successful when it was enacted is because the, the plan was very simple. Dayton is a small city. It's uh, 50 square miles. It's relatively square. And the schools are segregated uh, on two sides of the city. The river divides it. Divide, and it did divide the races. And so all that had to happen was a few students go from one building to another. That's all it was. And the rides were short, 20 minutes at most. So um, that was why it was held to be a very successful. Um, there was no violence. It was, uh, school attendance rates were very high. And there was no evidence of white flight, uh, at least no clear evidence of white flight. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But at any rate, uh, it, the, nonetheless, public support changed, and it changed rather dramatically, and, it, and it's not quite clear why. But at any rate, in 86, uh, a lot percentage, high percentage of African Americans approved of it. White parents seemed to disagree with it or disapprove. But by 2001, that was uh, changing. And of course, in 2002, the school board, the NAACP, the local NAACP, and the state of Ohio came to an agreement to end racial desegregation in, in Dayton. And it was the last city which had been under court-ordered desegregation at the time. Uh, at any rate, how did it operate? Uh, one thing you might want to notice that, that's important, and that is using uh, 2000 census information. Uh, Douglas Massey found that Dayton, the city of Dayton, was the third most segregated in the United States. Uh, so we have a, had a long, a long history of, day, of segregation. And it was very easy for the superintendent or for the school board to segregate the schools because all you had to do was build the schools in the neighborhood. Since the neighborhoods were already segregated, neighborhood schools made uh, segregation possible. So the superintendent could claim we have no policy for segregating schools, and that would be true. Nonetheless, in fact, they actually were. Uh, and part of the reason that they were segregated was that the Federal Housing Authority, which underlie, underwrote uh, mortgages, required that there be covenants forbidding the sale to African Americans in most areas of the city, with the exception of the West Side. Consequently, African Americans moved to the West Side. Um, most neighborhood schools, or all neighborhood schools, were one race. For example, when Dunbar was built in 62, it was almost 100% black. All right, what happened? There, in 1966, there's a big change in, the, in attitudes in, the United, in Dayton. That is, before 66, no one's really caring about desegregation, but in 66, we had a small riot. It was three hours long. I mean, it's not exactly like Los Angeles, where they tried to burn the city. But it, it took place over at the intersection of, uh, uh, let's see, it's 3rd and Broadway. It's on the west side. And a fellow was outside, African-American, He's sweeping his sidewalk, and a group of white men in a car come by, and they shoot him. So that's what starts that riot. There was a riot one year later when H. Rapp Brown, who was then the head of the SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, came to Dayton and gave a talk, and then there was a short riot. But they were very short. And nonetheless, there was a good deal of effort to try to bring about desegregation in general. Now, that coincided with general changes that were happening nationally, and that's what uh, this slide is to try to talk about. That is, in 65, the, um, remember after uh, Martin Luther King's speech, the I Have a Dream speech, the, where he is uh, at the Washington Memorial, that uh, the U.S. Congress passed, and um, that would be Lyndon Johnson signed, the U.S. Civil Rights Act. And that had one little clause in it which said that no person could suffer discrimination in a federally supported program. Uh, at the time, that, that 
that, no one paid much attention to that phrase. But that became the pressure that HEW, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, could use to impose or require desegregation in public schools. And they used it here in Dayton. But at any rate, at the same time, the uh, Legal Defense Fund of the NAACP won a whole progression of Supreme Court cases which expanded the notion of desegregation. So, for example, in 68, you could no longer say, as Dayton had been saying, well, it's open enrollment. If anybody wants to go to another school, they can go there. That's desegregation. No, said the Supreme Court, you've got to actually show that it has an effect. Uh, and then in 1972 in Denver, um, the Supreme Court agreed that a school board was guilty of mandating segregation if attendance zones created one-race schools. And attendance zones, is, uh, attendance zones is what Dayton had. That is a neighborhood, a circle around a neighborhood, and then you'd say everybody within that circle has to go to this school. Since the neighborhoods are segregated, attendance zones created segregated schools. Now, this is an important point because uh, the Supreme Court, or any court, cannot mandate, or could not mandate, uh, desegregation unless, they could pr unless lawyers could prove that the segregation had happened by legal means, that is, if some official had done it. So, of course, in the South, it's very easy because all the state constitutions in the South said all schools should be segregated. It's harder in the North. For example, in Ohio, from the late uh, 1800s, we've had in our constitution, or at least as an amendment, that schools cannot be segregated. So now, how do you prove that schools are segregated by official acts if, indeed, you have state requirements that they not be segregated? And of course, the answer is attendance zone policies. 1969, we got a new superintendent. And things just change. It's just a, like a, a breath of air. French was opposed to any kind of change. And now Wayne Carl comes in. He didn't, I interviewed him, by the way, when he, was, he came through Dayton when I was working on this. And I interviewed him. And he said, well, I did not come here to desegregate schools. However, once I was here, I noticed that people wanted that to happen. So I worked along with them. And in his first year, he appointed Margaret Peters and started a, a black history course. She was uh, particularly instrumental in, in changing the direction for black history uh, uh, here in Dayton and elsewhere. And what she did was she used it as a method or a way to talk about contributions of African Americans. In other parts of the country, it was often an anti-white uh, history. So, and then in uh, 1970, Wayne Carl, with the cooperation of the teachers' union, under the, under the pressure of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, because they were threatening them, uh, they desegregated the teachers. When a school had black students, it also had black teachers. When a school had white teachers, it, uh, white students, it also had white teachers. So in 1970, they were able to desegregate the teachers. And they did it without reducing the number of African American Administrators or teachers in other parts of the country, in the South especially, the way they would desegregate a school was to fire a black principal and put in a white principal. So a lot of black administrators lost their jobs as a result of desegregation. But at any rate, now, how did Wayne Carl, or how did the desegregate, he's pushing for desegregation. Who's on his side? He had two supporters, two important supporters. One was a, a, a grant that took place in the, um, north side of Dayton in what's called Dayton View. And it was a, called the Dayton View Stabilization Program. And they had adopted a program of multiple motivation where they introduced quality education in the neighborhood schools to show that desegregation didn't reduce the quality of education. The second was administrators and teachers in the Dayton Catholic schools were in favor of Carl's efforts and they tried to support him. They had failed in their own effort to try to desegregate Dayton's Catholic schools. Dayton Catholic schools were segregated. Um, and, but they had failed in doing that. Nonetheless, they joined with Carl. And in fact, uh, many of the Dayton area Catholic school teachers became public school teachers in an effort as part of that desegregation effort. The opponents now, he also had people against him. And he had two strong opponents. One was on the west side. It was uh, 
The Model Cities Demonstration Project, it was over by where Edison School is now, is actually Roosevelt High School, all that section. And uh, that program started in 1965, and it, uh, in 19, by 1967, black power activists took over the Model Cities, and they argued against desegregation. Now that twist, and the, use of, and the introduction of black power as a way of thinking about racial problems, happened in many other cities. It isn't just uh, Dayton at all. It happened in Milwaukee uh, and uh, happened in Chicago. 68 seems to have just been a real turning point. Uh, remember when Martin Luther King went to Chicago, uh, he was, people threw stones at him and then the, the black uh, students threw stones back. So, and then people like SNCC throw white people out of uh, the, the um, uh, their organization. But anyway, so the, that is one strong opponent. The other, the, in fact, they actually the stronger one, came from two people who resigned from Dayton schools. They were simply mad at, at uh, Carl. They won seats on the school board and they formed their own party and generally ran schools for until the 19, 1980s something. Well, Dayton went to court. And it went to court when it became clear that there was not going to be any willingness on the part of the school board to desegregate the schools. Uh, and the hope was for metropolitan desegregation. That means that there'd be no place for people to leave the city of Dayton to go to a suburban school, because all the suburban schools would be involved in the desegregation plan. Well, in 1974, Milliken versus Bradley, that's the first major defeat that the Legal Defense Fund of the NAACP suffered. It was an effort to try to integrate 52 suburban communities with the children in the, day, in the Detroit city schools. Um, and what the, what, they said, what the judges said was, you can only have desegregation, at least court ordered, when you can show officials had caused that segregation. Remember, that's the point that we made earlier about um, attendance zones, why attendance zones were important. Nonetheless, Dayton proceeded with the case, uh, the NAACP rather, proceeded with the case to uh, desegregate the schools. Interestingly, Wayne Carl helped the NAACP in that case. He opened all his files. They created a very strong case and, and I was able to look at those archives of the records they collected. They couldn't have got that information. They couldn't have built the case that they did without Wayne Carl's help. Of course, he lost his job immediately. But, uh, in 1976, the, the, the school busing started, buses rolled, schools opened, desegregation happened, and it was said to be wonderful. In 86, the, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, allowed school districts to end desegregation. And it's in this case, Riddick versus School Board. And, and the argument is that, well, we've done as much as we can, it's been 20 years, we've got a new generation, so things are much better. By, in April 2002, representatives from Dayton Schools, from the NAACP and the Ohio Department of Education agreed to stop it in, in Dayton. Now, nonetheless, problems remained even with the end of desegregation. And in fact, of course, uh, segregation, as one would expect, because the neighborhoods are still segregated, as one would expect, the schools became more segregated. So whatever busing had been going on, and it was largely inadequate because the schools were still segregated even under court order. So um, there were some, some difficulties there. But at any rate, um, and the Dayton schools continued to have problems. I remember having an argument with one of my colleagues in which he said, that the schools were going to have a remarkable increase in student achievement when the busing ended. And I said, no, that's not going to happen. And I was willing to, to bet a lot of money. And it's a good thing he didn't take my bet. But I would have won uh, because the Dayton schools, again, just continued their decline in uh, student achievement. And, there was, they had no, and the school board had no way that they thought of to try to change things. All right, now this is that issue about white flight. Did desegregation cause white flight? In every city in the United States, in the last part of the 20th century, there had been a continual exodus of white 
students and white people from cities, white students from public schools. Now, how or why does that happen? Well, it's a fairly, probably a fairly complicated answer, but the simple answer is people move every five years, and people, when they move into an area, buy a home where they can most easily sell it and when it looks like something that they've been in before. And those characteristics of real estate seem to uh, serve suburban areas more than rural areas, or urban areas, rather. <coughs> Well, at any rate, uh, was there white flight? Uh, this is a consulting firm that did a survey for the Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission. You can download it if you wish. It's got a lot of good information in it. And what they found was that uh, there was white flight in the sense that lots of middle class students left Dayton City Schools and low income students stayed in uh, the urban schools. The suburban communities had small population growth, but most of the, the much higher school-age population. And almost none of those children in the suburbs were from low-income families. Uh, did the desegregation actually cause white flight? I, I would, these are the best figures that I have for Dayton. They're from the Ohio Department of Education. I'm not sure that I want to stand, stake my life on these numbers, but there's a, um, a national study by a fellow by the name of Colt Charles Klotfelter, and he found that generally the same pattern occurred in, in all cities, or in most cities. And that is that the percentage of white students leaving during a desegregation move, or at least before desegregation, before desegregation was steady. Then that rate of exodus, the loss of white students, increased. Now, Klotfelter said it goes usually 2 to 4 percent. In Dayton, it was about 3 percent. Uh, and then it just goes right back to that same gradual decline. So uh, that is what I just said. It, an interesting point, I mean, if you're going to say that busing caused white flight, then the end of busing in 2002 should have stopped the exodus of white people. It didn't. So the exodus continues. The number of students white students in Dayton City Schools is continuing to decline. In fact, the number of students in Dayton City Schools is declining rapidly. What caused it? Well, again, going back to that same survey from the Miami Valley Planning Council, they argued that it was the state uh, policies, uh, the financial system, that pit communities against communities so that the the effort is for those outlying suburban areas to try to get more businesses to move to them and then, of course, more opportunity, the, the middle class follows those uh, businesses. At the same time, the region experienced a significant loss of population. Now that may have masked white flight. So, I mean, at the time, 75, 76, you couldn't see it in the neighborhoods. You couldn't see it in uh, what was going on around it because generally there's a decline in population, I mean, uh, in, in, in opportunities for work and in population. NCR closed. Uh, we used to have a, a publishing center downtown where Sinclair College is now. Red Book was published there, Life Magazine, Reader's Digest. We had manufacturing, Frigidaire, General Motors, all of those things. Dayton Tire, it's no longer in Dayton. And all of those, as they moved out, of course, population followed those. We don't even have NCR anymore. Uh, all of those, um, as all of those businesses moved out, then uh, population followed them. So it's hard to tell, really, what's going on. At any rate, one of the big questions is whether or not racial desegregation was a good thing for African American students. And at least one study, but there's many studies that do the same thing. It is not, you, there's still a persistent gap. There always seems to be a persistent gap in academic achievement or in um, things like uh, teenage pregnancy. That is, there's, the, the problems are more among African, low income fa African Americans from low income families than among uh, white students, there's, so uh, at least among middle class white students. So there's always that persistent gap. But nonetheless, 
with racial desegregation, it does appear that the conditions for African American students, low income African American students, does increase, uh, does get better. So it doesn't bring miracles, but it does increase the chances of African Americans securing professional jobs as adults. My view is that it simply makes for a better country. It's just better to have different groups together and it's what we should have as a democracy. And that's irrespective of these practical concerns. But, but the practical concerns still and all are important. I'm not going to deny that. Um, it doesn't solve all problems, that is racial desegregation, but it does make life, uh, it does re reduce some of those factors that make life difficult for African Americans.